LegalizeFreedom.com Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Beyond politics, poverty and war. LegalizeFreedom.com Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host Greg Moffat and my guest today is Thomas Sheridan. Born in Dublin, Thomas is an internationally renowned artist, author, musician, public speaker and independent researcher. His illustrations have appeared on the covers of newsstand magazines, books and websites worldwide. He's best known for being the author of the book Puzzling People, The Labyrinth of the Psychopath. He has recently published the follow-up to Puzzling People, entitled Defeated Demons, Freedom from Consciousness Parasites in Psychopathic Society, as well as the DVD, Breaking the Babylon Mind. Thomas continues to write, broadcast and tour internationally, bringing his message of consciousness empowerment, creative intention and transcendence beyond the psychopathic control grid to the world at large. It's this key message uh, that we'll concentrate on today, examining the origins and development of psychopaths as individuals, the psychopathic nature of the institutions and systems which underpin our society, and ultimately, how we can and will break free from both towards a truly humane and empathic world. Hello and welcome, Thomas Sheridan. Thank you very much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. Hi, Greg. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me on. Not at all. My pleasure. And I, I've uh, hooked up with you today because I recently went and uh, heard you give a presentation uh, at an event over in Manchester. And as part of that, I uh, discovered your books, uh, the most recent of which is Defeated Demons, Freedom from Consciousness Parasites in Psychopathic Society. Uh, very interesting read, I have to say. Quite, quite disturbing read, to be honest with you, at times. And the nub of it seems to be basically uh, what a lot of people suspect but can't maybe put a name to it is that um, there's a psychopathic element in human society and surprise, surprise, for the most part, it's running it's running things. And once you realize that, once you come to that understanding and once you look under that stone, as it were, a lot of things about society, about the world that don't make sense, seen through that psychopathic lens, suddenly start to make sense. So I'll get you to comment on that in general, but also I know you have a sort of a definition of um, psychopath um, in uh, you talk about it in both books. Uh, perhaps you can just set out for folks who might be thinking psychopath, that's Hannibal Lecter, it's uh, Anders Breivik, people like that. There's a bit more to it than that, isn't there? Yeah, well, those kinds of people are psychopaths, too. But there's a psychopathic spectrum. Uh, not very, very few psychopaths are violent. I mean, physically violent. Very, very few. That's too messy for them. But all of them are psychologically and emotionally violent. And that's where they really damage us. They get into our heads, both collectively and as individuals. And they change our reality to make us believe, essentially, that in time, that black is white and white is black. Uh, this is called crazy making. It's also another th technique they use called gaslighting, which I'll talk about later. The standard definition for the term psychopath was, it's been around for about 100 years, started in the Victorian era, but Herbie Cleckley, an American psychiatrist in the 1947 book, The Mask of Sanity, basically said, a psychopath is an individual who is otherwise a facsimile of a normally functioning human being, who creates, a, who creates false personas inside themselves in order to target people for repeatedly and deliberately purposeful destructive behavior. They have an internal state of chaos, and this internal state of chaos they project onto others by causing chaos around others and around their, their environment, and indeed not only their relationships, but even entire societies. 
And this chaos allows the psychopath to maintain control. So a psychopath is an individual who has an internal state of chaos. And then by being a facsimile or being a copy of a normal person in its behavior, then manipulates everyone around them by creating chaos and then capitalizes upon this chaos. Order out of chaos. Dare order out of our chaos. So essentially by concentrating or having our minds concentrated, having our attention directed to one particular extreme of psychopathic behavior, which you're saying is actually a minority behavior, um, we're missing out the spectrum of psychopathic behavior, the broad range that there actually is. Oh yes, there's hundreds of millions of psychopaths in the world, even by the most conservative estimates. It's, around, it, it's, it's about 1 in 27 people in society are psychopathic to some degree. So you are literally surrounded by hundreds of millions of them. They're not all extreme. Most of them would just be parasites and users, people who manipulate, de deceive, and use other people. It could be anything from marrying them just to find a place to live, to stealing their money, to swindling them out of their, their you know, pension, to just even conning and manipulating them for a one-night stand. But the thing is, what makes a psychopath very different than any other human being, and we've all done things in our lives that we, you know, we're all ashamed of, but that's the difference. A psychopath has absolutely no shame, no remorse, and no guilt. That goes from stealing someone's wallet all the way up to committing genocide. It's just a business thing with them. When they want something or they need something, they will do whatever it takes to get it. There will be no morality. There will be no question of you know, of a moral imperative. It's purely just, I need this, I want that, I'm taking it. And that's the end of it. And they don't, they don't care who they destroy, kill, or emotionally or psychologically torture along the way, because that will also be part of the technique to get what they want from others. And that's what happens. You see, they deliberately put this, you see, because most of the, the world's, you know, institutions, both political and corporate and things like, you know, intergovernmental global groups and transnational organizations, because they're run by psychopaths or at least run according to a psychopathic philosophy, if they have a vested interest in telling Hollywood and TV to make sure that everyone who's a psychopath is portrayed as either Hannibal Lecter or, or as uh, Norman Bates, to put them into an, an almost kind of a, a mythological motif mm. where they're kind of real and they're not real and this takes the this takes our eye off the ball of what's really going on well given that the natural human state seems to be empathy for our fellow human beings and a general desire to to help people you know and to have relationships and family and all those things are priorities when we're allowed to be ourselves to be human a lot of, this is what I was alluding to at the start, a lot of the insanity in the world, the, the, the violence and the destruction and the, and the you know, certain policies, uh, environmental destruction and the financial system, all of which to people, average people, just seems to be insane and seems to be self-destructive or destructive of everything around it or, you know, just a, a one way, like absolute blind alley, one way street starts to make sense when you consider that uh, although you and I don't have any great desire to control uh, organizations, to control other people, to tell other people what to do, that there is a tendency in society to do that and they tend to get their hands on the reins of power and mayhem follows. Exactly. And the world does begin to make sense because it's been engineered to be nonsensical. I often refer to the psychopaths in positions of power as the merchants of nonsense. That's what they really, at the end of the day, provide us with. And it's not, it doesn't even have to be anything as spectacular as like vast environmental destruction. It's even quite small things like when people would read the paper and you hear one year that coffee will give you cancer, and then the next week, another report comes out telling you that coffee will cure cancer. And then another week after that, that coffee is bad for pregnant women. And then another week after that, another report that coffee is great. See, we're constantly being driven mad. We cannot think straight. And if we can't think straight, we acquiesce and hand over our psychological sovereignty 
to these authority figures. Our education system has also played an enormous part in this as well. We've been deliberately engineered to have our left brains dominant over our right brains in terms of how we function. And what we are basically in life after we've completed our education is we're like a charioteer that has a chariot where one wheel is bigger than the other, with the left mm. side of the left brain, and we're constantly trying to maintain control just to survive, just to get by. And eventually we, we say, well, the hell with that, and we, we ask for we Then we depend on experts uh, appointed to tell us how to think. And this is why we, this is how we're played in the traps constantly. They've made, you know, that's why, that's why the most close-minded and the most... Uh, in my opinion, pathetic people on this earth are the ones that have the highest levels of education. Mm. You know, as soon as you get to a PhD, you've got a closed mind that's incapable of thinking of anything new. And that's all part of their system as well. Yeah, I was going to, uh, you've come on to education uh, quite early on. I was going to get to that later on, but um, I don't know if you've read any of the work by John Taylor Gatto um, on the education system, but his, his book, um, which I've just completed recently, uh, weapons of mass instruction. When you read that, you hear a detailed breakdown of how institutionalized forced schooling is designed to to, to break our intellect and to, to create a you know a nation of obedient uh, shoppers basically, and that in itself is a psychopathic end. And then you go you go back and look at the people who instituted that you know the, the Prussian thinking that went yeah. into the the formal schooling, and again it starts to make sense. Ivan Illich wrote a phenomenal little book back in the 70s called The Schooling Society. And he says, you know, he, he says, all, he, you know, reiterates re all the, the quotes you just gave then. Yeah, but he, he brings it down to something that I thought was very powerful and simple. He says the purpose of an education, formal education, is to spend all this time and all this money being told that society is fine just the way it is. Yes. And I think that was the best way I've ever heard of something. <clears throat> Well, yeah, we are conditioned, aren't we? That the most obvious, even on the night, even on the mainstream nightly news, we can see things, uh, you know, events, people saying things, stories, all manner of situations globally that are either patently not what we're being told they are. We can see they're not. We intellectually, or even in our heart, perhaps know they're not. And yet, a lot of people will sit there and go, "Okay, none of this makes sense. Four and four equals, you know, nine. But it, the TV says so. So in order for them to preserve their sanity as they would see it, they embrace, you know, the insanity. They actually believe they swallow the lie and convince themselves. I think it's cognitive dissonance, isn't it, they call it? Yeah. Your cognitive dissonance is an interesting one because what that really means is that at some level, you know, the thing that you're being repulsed by is actually the truth. You know, you'd have a family where... You'd have two daughters who may have been molested as young teenage girls by the father. And one girl comes out and says, publicly, our father was a child molester. And the other sister who was molested as well will violently say, that's a scandal. How dare you say that about our dad? Mm -hmm. That's because she knows it's the truth. And that's what really drives cognitive dissonance. That's why you're confronted when you... You know, when you talk to people about subjects that, you know, guys like us are know about in terms of, you know, being awake, there's a revulsion there. And that revulsion is caused by a chemical discharge in the brain from the reptilian complex. It's a hormone called neopinephrine. It's actually a stress hormone that fires up from the, the lower brainstem. And uh, what happens then is literally the person is that you're confronting with this information, even in a friendly manner. Is, uh, is suddenly shocked and horrified. And what happens then is, because they're having this like state of shock, their only recourse to that is to try and re release a burst of serotonin and mm -hmm. dopamine in their brain. And the way they can quickly do that is by ridiculing you, by calling you an idiot or a retard or a moron or a conspiracy theorist, as all these lunatic newspaper journalists whip out. And that's what we're up against. Like I can, I recently found some old Irish newspapers mm -hmm. from the 1970s, eight, 1980s, and there were people, there were people that were around Ireland then saying that the Catholic Church are using children's orphanages to uh, as sex parlors for priests. 
and uh, nuns are actually getting money from big pharmaceutical companies to allow the children inside the Catholic orphanages to be used for, you know, <coughs> live human experimentation, giving them medications and seeing what the side effects were. And the same journalists, many of them also related to the ones who are currently under Irish journalists today, would be ridiculing and admonishing people who spoke the truth back then. Mm-hmm. And these are the same, this is the same s- s- neuroses. In fact, I would go further than that. I would actually call it a mental illness. That's the same mental illness that the majority of mainstream journalists suffer from today. They are incapable of actually understanding the truth as we see it. That's why the, you, you could have them standing, you could have them standing in a, you could put them in a room and in, in, King Kong could walk into that room beating his chest, a 50 foot gorilla. And they would not believe it until they got a government, corporate, or university press release yes. informing them that King Kong was in that room. That's what journalism is like today. See, and that's how the cognitive dissonance uh, mind control program has become so phenomenally powerful that people, the so called people who are supposed to be protecting us from the corporations and governments, are now their biggest cheerleaders. And it's getting worse with each passing year. And of course, we were talking earlier about, you know, the, the it's, well, it's an alarmingly large number to think of the number of psychopaths there might be in society, but it's still the minority. And the people we're talking about, uh, as an example, journalists, uh, media people as gatekeepers and, you know, the people who present to us quite often the false view of the world, uh, the lies, the false view of reality. We're not saying that they're all psychopaths, but they're probably as much victims of psychopaths as anything. And they're they enable the psychopath to, uh, to 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 have the effect that they do, the widespread effect, and to control uh, the paradigm. So there's a lot. Oh, of yeah, yeah, yeah. Like in *Defeat of Demons*, you know, the paradigm. They speak about like how journalism is. They will actually actively recruit pe- people who are alcoholics, or may have a drug problem. Now that's why journalists were always so associated in the past with being like drunks. Mm-hmm. I don't know how it is, but in Ireland it was always like in America. I know it was like that. There's the hack, the drunken hack. Mm-hmm. You know, that kind of thing. And that was deliberately done because they knew an alcoholic newspaper journalist would do anything to get his fix. Mm-hmm. So they, that's the kind of ones they would, so they, would, they would literally report anything. Now, anything that's ever been discovered that truly was groundbreaking was never produced or hardly ever produced by a mainstream journalist. He was just too busy writing what he was told to write because he just wanted his paycheck and he become a kind of a proto-psychopath telling lies from week in and week out. Anyone who ever discovered anything real in terms of an amazing story was uncovered were usually independent journalists or not even journalists, often authors working outside the system yeah. and uncovering things like, well, the DDT's uh, damage in America that was never covered by the major newspapers in America that was independent researchers getting all the local small regional newspapers and finding all the articles relating to damage at a local level by DDT and then actually writing a book or doing an article about it exposing how big the DDT pollution problem was in terms of destroying wildlife in order to just you know this insecticide it was actually destroying vast areas of the United States, wiping all the wildlife out. Now that that was that that was back in the 1970s. That would have been they would have been the bloggers or the you know the alternative people of the day. Yes. But it just goes to show you, we will never ever find, get mainstream journalists who ever serve the interests of society. In fact, most mainstream journalists, particularly in newspapers, pride themselves on being gatekeepers of the system. Mm-hmm. Um, now, regarding uh, nature versus nurture in all of this, the development of um, a psychopath of, of whatever stripe, whether, you know, well, I can we say moderate, I'm not sure we can have a moderate psychopath, but wherever they fall in the spectrum, to what extent is there a natural tendency in a human being uh, to be this way? And to what degree can societal influences or parental influences uh, bring out this tendency well that's a different thing a natural born psychopath is born that way that's literally a psychopathic consciousness that enters into a human body and it's like that moment it's, it's a pure psychopath predator subspecies parasite from the time it it's born as a baby right until the time it dies it never changes 
Now, you could have a situation where someone could be what I call a proto-psychopath, where they would be an otherwise normal human being who may be born into a, a situation where you would have like uh, sexual abuse in the family or a sectarian situation in the war, and they would develop these, these psychopathic tendencies in order to basically survive. You know, mm-hmm. but if you got those people, you could cure them in most cases. A psychopath, you can't cure. So a pure psychopath, I'm talking about the actual one that's had came from a normal family. You know, that's the majority of psychopaths do come from pure psychopaths seem to come from like fairly normal farm families where there was no history of any problem in there. I mean, it's and you know, there's a, this is another thing we were talking about the this. They want to portray it as a, a serial killer issue. They're also very quick to portray it as a, a poor people's issue. In fact, even Harvey Cleckley back in the 40s, there's a hint of racism in some of his own writings claiming that, uh, you know, it's only affecting poor marginal immigrant groups, you know, because they live in poverty and stuff like that. Well, the reality is the Vanderbilts, the J.P. Morgans, uh, the Rockefellers, the Bushes, and the Blairs did not grow up in slums. They grew up with all the advantage in the world, and they're the most psychopathic of them all. Now, it's one thing for us to be talking about the psychopathic tendency manifesting itself in society and the world at large, uh, but particularly with your uh, first book on the subject, uh, Puzzling People, um, you're dealing a lot with um, how people c- cope, can cope, do cope or not cope with a psychopath in their own life. And this reaches its most disturbing um, nadir, I suppose, when it's your partner or a member of your family, uh, but it still has to be faced. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you'll be destroyed if you don't face it. You'll, you see, this is a... This is one of the things we're always told, that there's some good in everyone and everyone can be reformed. Uh, that's not true with psychopaths. We're, we're dealing with a very different species here. We're not dealing with human beings as such. And uh, they, they're, they're, a, they're a biological parasite out to get the rest of us. So it's a horrific thing for someone to realize they were married to one or maybe have a brother or sister, a parent who's one. But the answer is always the same, or even a son or daughter. As soon as they le- reach legal age, you just walk away. You just walk away and throw away the throw away the key and and try and get do everything to get them out of your life because they will forever exploit, manipulate, and torture you. There's no happy endings with a psychopath as long as the psychopath is in the, in your life. Uh, look, I have a forum psychopathfree.com and it deals with you know people who've been abused on it mainly through relationships but not not exclusively we also deal with people who've been bullied at work by psychopaths and uh, the only time they start to get hope what they start to recover from the post traumatic stress disorder is when they cut the bonds they throw away every memento they ever have of that person. They change their phone number. They they block them on Facebook, and they they never they never see them again. Mm-hmm. Because while the psych the psychopath is the ultimate energy vampire, they will even by doing nothing, just looking at them, will make you want to vomit after the the way they've treated you because you're so damaged by the chemical manipulation they've done to you through playing with your mind and distorting it in all different ways. So the only solution there is no contact ever again. And people say to me, well, how could you walk away from your own family, your own brother, your own sister? I would say, look, or your own son. I says, because you may feel that way, but you have to stop thinking that way yourself. What will happen is they will, be, they, they will play on you with pity. Using pity is one of the main tactics they use to find empathic people to manipulate them. And they, while while they are pretending to be all saved and all, you know, reformed or whatever, they'll be doing things like having sex with your your, your wife. Mm. You know, they'll be doing things like stealing your money. They'll be uh, going through your bank accounts, uh, it, and you'll suddenly find out that you've lost fifty thousand pounds. This is the kind that they'll be putting smear campaigns out there, calling you all kinds of names, even na- things you could not imagine, like a pedophile or something, stuff like that. They'll say you're gay when you're straight and straight when you're gay. And it'll all be about destroying you. And all the time you're thinking to yourself, uh, you know, I can't do that to him. He's my own brother. And unfortunately, that's how it is. That's you just this thing. This thing is so dangerous, so, so wicked, so cold and so businesslike that does flesh and blood means nothing to them except a very useful way to uh, a very useful insurance policy to fall back on if their other scams collapse. Now, in life, um, even the luckiest of us are 
you know, unfortunately at some point come across a, a cheat or a, a fraud or a very manipulative person. And some would say, well, to, to categorize them, if they are, you know, not all people who behave like that will necessarily be psychopathic, but to categorize them that way kind of creates a, a block in people's minds for them to come to terms with it because the term psychopathic is for, the, for most people is so extreme. But mm. rather than kind of adopt a, a sort of panoply of, of subsections and, and categories and what have you, you, you've not so much to say embrace the term psychopath is the wrong expression, but you've been very clear that this, this term is one that you want to use. You haven't shied away from it. And in fact, you've wanted to somewhat reclaim it from academic obscurity where it has just applied to serial killers, basically. Or it's even been written out of the DSM. It's even actually been written out of the books for a while. Uh, that's because it, the, the, the Diagnostic Statistics Manual of the American Psychiatric Association, which is responsible for creating up these disorders and who basically have declared everyone on, the, on this planet to be mentally ill at this stage, that's 27, a panel of 27 experts they're called experts. Most of them are psychiatrists and clinical psychologists who are also on the board of big pharma companies mm. and, and that kind of thing. And they sign a non-binding agreement. They sign a binding agreement, not a, non a non-disclosure agreement, I'm sorry, not to speak about any of the debates or anything that goes on when they're talking about the rationale for creating these so-called disorders. What they're really doing is they're drumming up business. So instead of calling something a psychopath, They'll call a female psychopath having borderline personality disorder. A poor psychopath will have antisocial personality disorder and so on. And the idea, a criminal one, they might call a sociopath and so on. And the reason for this is it's purely to create treatment packages that mm. they can sell. It's purely driven by money. And furthermore, there's another one in recent years. And this is the psychopath's favorite term that they like to use for themselves is a narcissist because it's a condition, a ridiculous condition called narcissistic personality disorder. All of us are narcissistic to some degree. We all have that in us. The psychopath is not just narcissistic. So they're psych narcissistic and they're extreme predators, and they have no remorse about what they do, but they like calling themselves narcissists because it makes them almost seem like complicated Victorian dandies who need to be, who just have you know, difficult geniuses. They have to be sort of dealt with. They're not really so <laughs> yes. bad. It, this is like, like I always say, it's, it's, you know, calling a psychopath a narcissist is like calling a rapist a selfish lover. It's, it's just, it's the only term we can use for them as psychopath because I know for a fact psychopaths hate being called psychopaths. It actually, it drives them insane because it's calling a spade a spade. And another thing about the word is it has a certain emotional resonance, resonance when someone hears it. You cannot water down the term psychopath. It, totally allows people to see what's, what they're really up against and what the real danger here is to themselves, their children, their families, their communities, or even their indeed, their, indeed their entire nation. And so what's the remarkable thing that happened when I started writing Puzzling People, the term psychopath had not vanished, but it was just exclusively being used for, uh, for uh, you know, serial killers, people like the, you know, Ted Bundy's and so on. And that's completely switched around now. You're seeing articles in magazine, newspapers like The Guardian and The New York Times talking about corporate psychopaths, government psychopaths, child psychopaths. And they're talking about the kind of people that I've outlined and puzzling people. So we would, a, real, a real victory has been achieved here. More and more people are writing books about experiences that they've had with psychopathic men or psychopathic women. They're no longer calling them narcissists or sociopaths. They're calling books in terms like My Life with a Psychopath. Now, that brings up something else, Greg, that's important. Mm -hmm. It's very easy for someone who's a, a failure in some way in terms of a relationship or whatever, or they, their relationship didn't work out and they're annoyed by it, to call somebody a psychopath as a coping mechanism. Uh, this is why I go to such extreme lengths to repeat myself about what a psychopath is and puzzling people, because this term must not be used or applied to anyone who isn't a psychopath. Mm. You're either a psychopath or you're not. It's as simple as that. There's no, there's no, you can't be half pregnant or one third pregnant. So that's why in Puzzling People, I laid out extremely specific criteria, the five absolute traits. This was done through a database I actually had been gathering over the last, well, last three or four years uh, based on interviews and also on profiling of famous psychopaths 
both violent and regular ones. And these, these five absolute traits, if they have all five of them, you're dealing with a psychopath. So it doesn't matter if they're a male or a female, rich, poor, violent, or a rapist, or just a corporate psychopath. They have the five absolute traits. If they have four of them, they're not a psychopath. They're just a creep. And that was what my main thing was. The five, the five absolute traits are using pity to manipulate other people, invented personas. They don't have a personality as such. They pretend to be somebody to manipulate people. They have missing past histories. You can after say after the age of thirties, it's very they, they seem to just appear on the scene. It's very difficult to find out where they really came from. There's huge sections of their life that are missing. The next absolute trait is they have no remorse, compassion, or empathy. They'll do anything they want without a care in the world and don't even understand why they should even feel bad about it. And the fifth one is high levels of the hormone testosterone in both males and females. If they have all five of those absolute traits, they're a psychopath. If they have four, they don't. And mm-hmm. that was my that was the sort of fail the fail safe switch that I came up with, so we would not have witch hunts against people who are just creeps and cretins and low lives and womanizers and, and swindlers and you know and calling them psychopaths as a coping mechanism. I've seen it happen. It's not as bad as people think it is. It's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. But I've seen them even on my own forum, and we weed them out ASAP because they're just looking to project their own failings on another person by calling them a psychopath. And this is great ultimately for the psychopaths. Because yes. a psychopath can then hide. Yeah, because so we it, have to be very careful. We can't be calling everyone a psychopath. You're right about that. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, because we're no further forward then because if we in, a, in an effort to identify, deal with, root out the psychopathic behavior and individuals in society if we then start, it becomes a bit McCarthyite, doesn't it? Then, if we start, you know, uh, psychopaths under the beds, and everybody starts to get designated as a possible psychopath because of one bad thing they've done or one bad habit they have, then suddenly there's a we don't see the, you know, the, the psychopaths for the forest of, of uh, you know, misdiagnosed yeah. psychopaths, basically. Yeah, because when you call someone, yeah, and then, then that destroys what we're trying to achieve here. I'm approaching it now as a as a, as a public health policy, quite simply. It, uh, we're there, they're like we have to treat them like a disease or a virus or a bacteria. We have to isolate and quarantine them from us. I'm not talking about locking them up and putting them in camps. That's what they do to us. I'm talking about if you're aware of one in your own personal life, you just get away from them. You just mm-hmm. have nothing to do with them. Okay, it's as simple as that. You don't have to oppress them, imp- oppress them, confront them, report them to the cops. You just get the hell away and get on with your life. And it's the same thing with the, with the, with, at, the, at the global and at the actual like, macro level. You do not comply with the system if the system is disgusting. If the system mm-hmm. is psychopathic, you do not comply with it. You just don't. You just do not comply. You refuse to do as they tell you. You hide. You keep a low profile. And you get on with your life as best as you can without having to depend on the authority figures or the quote-unquote experts of what I call the psychopathic control grid. It's a very simple thing in many ways. The simplicity of it is you just do nothing really and you just walk away from the psychopath. And you see, this is very difficult for people in a relationship with a psychopath because what happens is they become addicted to the psychopath because the psychopath knows this. They use things called love bombing where they, they in the early days of the relationship, they literally get the person addicted to the psychopath because they... They, they love bomb them. Every five minutes they tell them how perfect and wonderful they are. Just like the Obama campaign did in 2008. Made every promise under the sun. So you become addicted. You become addicted to the chemical rush of serotonin and dopamine in your brain every time you hear these lovely promises and lovely words. And then the psychopath takes it away. And what happens then? You crash. And when you crash, you want to fix it, that stuff back. And this is why you're still having people. Even after, now I'm not saying Obama's a psychopath. I don't think, I don't think of Obama as a psychopath, but he definitely, he definitely has run a psychopathic kind of campaign. And, that, and who's ever behind him are definitely using a psychopathic kind of technique. But that's why you have people saying, oh, and we know Obama, he was, he did everything wrong. Every promise he ever made was, he, you know, he, 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 he back, you know, he, he backtracked on. But in 2012, if we elect him again, He'll change, and he really will do that stuff. And what those people are tra- really, what's they're really trapped. What they're really looking for is the rush of, uh, you know, happy feely chemicals that the whole hopey changey thing back in two thousand and seven made them feel. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll we'll come back to uh, psychopaths and psychopathic behaviour on the, the macro level in a moment. I'm just interested to find out. Um, have you looked? <laughs> have you looked into uh, the psychopathic tendency in the great sort of sweep of human? history and evolution as it were whether you believe we evolved in a, in a darwinistic sort of fashion or not or perhaps just dropped here from another planet whatever uh kind of worldview you have because it strikes me that in indigenous societies uh they have a, a different way of interacting uh with each other and with with the world around them they're very much part of it and we don't seem to see the same behaviors manifesting uh, even in the indigenous people, what's left of them are remaining today. So I just wondered if you if you'd looked into that angle. Oh yeah, big time. The uh, the psychopath doesn't seem to exist in indigenous societies. The reason for this is they kill them. I mean, that's literally what happens. Uh, if they discover the very rare case of a psychopath appears in an indigenous society, uh, they will quickly see them by the time they're in their late teens what they're really like and then I'll take them on a hunting exhibition one day and they'll, they'll meet with them unfortunate accidents because the survival of the tribe in terms of having to survive within nature is far more uh, has a far greater precedence than the individual needs of any psychopath hmm. what happened would when the psychopath seems to well, I'll tell you some of the story that happened to me in 2010 I was speaking to an African shaman guy at some event in Dublin we just got talking and he, uh, he asked me what I was doing, and I says, well, I, I basically write books about psychopaths, and I lecture and talk and tour on that. And he went, ah, the psychopaths, yeah, yeah, I know all about them. And he goes, uh, uh, they're, they're actually, what the psychopaths, this is what he said, what the psychopaths are, are the demon world trying to invade this world. <laughs> and they do it by possessing people. This is what he said. And then he said, and the reason why they do that is because people in the West... You've, you've been taught how to hate yourselves by the psychopaths who run your advertising and your media. And you're always looking to, you're always feeling inferior. And that's what he said, that the, psych, the demon world is the psychopaths of the demon world trying to invade this world. And I really went on and I thought about that. And I said, even, you know, and I really thought about it for a long time. And I said, you know something? He's absolutely right. Now, when he says demon, we don't have to necessarily mean a demonic creature or something. But a, a negative predatory consciousness representing the duality of the cosmos. You'd have a duality in everything. So why wouldn't you have a duality of consciousness? Why wouldn't you have negative consciousness and positive consciousness? And that to me was that to me cracked the secret of the psychopath there for me right there. And then I believe there are predatory consciousness representing the overall duality of the universe. And there was that African shaman who basically opened up my mind to this because of one that point I was Mr. All reduction of science. Now that's not to say I don't believe that there's actually a supernatural quality to, to things. I absolutely know there is. Absolutely. But uh, it's very complex and it's definitely rooted in human uh, human consciousness. Now regarding their evolution yeah I do believe in the sort of biological evolution but I don't believe it's caught by survival of the fittest. I think that's a psychopathic tendency that's put out there by Victorian elites to make to, you know to make sure that they felt better to everyone else so they could keep sending nine-year-olds down the mines. Mm -hmm. I don't know what triggers evolution. I suspect it's human consciousness. In fact I think I'm pretty sure it is if you look, and people look on, on the internet, they'll see a, a talk I do at the art convention in Bath, Bath last year called How to Paint Yourself Out of a Corner. And I show how basically language and creativity is what caused human evolution. And that's, and uh, both in our personal lives and, uh, and, and as a species. So what happened was at the time of the Babylonian Empire, because agricultural systems became very efficient in terms of irrigation and storage of of grains and so on the psychopaths were able to then jump to the top of the pyramid within babylon they could control the food supply because when you have a situation where the food is a as a regular basis you know when it's going to come you know that the people are going to be ready for it at a certain time well then you have control of everything Yes. You know, the, 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 the behavior of Monsanto today began in Babylon three and a half thousand years ago. The, and then these psychopaths, then they knew how to control things. And then, then they would notice changes in people when they changed their diet. When they moved them over to a more carbohydrate-based diet, they would have seen that they're, they're not 
they would not have been as mentally quick as they were. They were a bit. They were not as weak as they were. Lots. They were not as strong as they used to be. They'd be a lot weaker, and they'd have to be. They'd be constantly having glycemic crashes, so they'd have to eat grains all the time. Where before mm. that, they would have had a piece of fish and a few apples, and they would have been good for a whole day. So this allowed the psychopaths are tremendous observers of human behavior. And then that would have transferred into things like magical rituals and stuff like that, where nighttime torch-lit processions, where the idea of the star, the star came from, and star worship and celebrity worship. So as far as I'm concerned, I've seen no, no evidence of a psychopathic controlling system prior to the Babylonian Empire, but I've seen nothing but psychopathic controlling systems since the Babylonian Empire. So what happened there... And, uh, and I think I think that w- we really have to look back at our history and see that that's been one long continuum from Babylon through you know Greece and Rome, the British and French empires, and now the American, the Dutch empires, and now the American empires. It's been the same lineage all the way through. Mm. So you know, it, it, it's it, once the psychopaths got in power, they infected the human social order like a parasite or a virus because that's what they are. And I think now with the awakening community, community, we're now actually on a state of another set. We're actually on the, the cusp of another evolutionary jump. And maybe we're, we're ready to outpace them or jump past them. And I think that's why they're terrified right now. I think that's why they're sticking sodium fluoride in the water, put as many vaccines in the kids as possible. And filling the TV shows with all these skeptics and debunkers and pseudo skeptics and the likes of Richard Dawkins and saying you've no such sure thing as a soul and so on. They're getting ready. They're, they're, they know that they know that a leap is coming. A new evolutionary leap is coming. And I think the people of the awakened community are are the ones who are, are getting there first. And that's why there's a lockdown right now. Yeah. Well, the the <clears throat> the positive place that you're kind of headed to there is somewhere we'll end up. Uh, at the end of our talk, I very much hope and I hope we will end up there literally as well. Uh, just have you read a book called The Fall by a guy no. by a guy called Steve Taylor? It sounds familiar, but I haven't read it. No, def- the title definitely sounds familiar. Well, it's very interesting uh, in connection with what you just said, because he talks about basically the history of human development, indigenous societies and the point at which they changed their, the nature of society changed and it's exactly tied in with agriculture and what that allowed to happen. They allowed large cities, the hunter-gatherer lifestyle fell by the wayside. Our diet changed and that ties in with some other reading I've done recently. Um, I wish I had the author's names, but a book called Wheat Belly, all about the effects of wheat on the human body and health. And another one called uh, Primal Body, Primal Mind, which is extolling the virtues of the Neolithic diet. And it nexus is in with everything you've been saying about the arc that human society has been on, you know, for the last few thousand years. And it explains so much of why things look the way they are now and why we have all these degenerative diseases that we didn't have, you know, maybe five, ten thousand years ago. And we're not as strong. I, I'm down with all that. I agree with all that stuff. We're also not as strong as what we were. You look at you look at the, the construction projects and engineering projects that were done prior to Babylon. There are still some of the most impressive engineering ever on earth. Mm. After that, it was just not the same. It just wasn't. And a lot of it had to do with the, the mental and the uh, the uh, the physical well-being of people. I believe that the Babylonian Empire had it not have been infected by psychopaths, we probably would have been flying to the moon by the Middle Ages. You know, mm. we were that badly held back. So it's like in terms of our technology and everything and our actual abilities as a species to, to, to grow. You see, this is what happens. It, well, it, like, it's always an interesting thing with dynamic with the psychopath in that it's like this whole, you know, what goes on at the microcosm is reflected in the microcosm and vice versa. A person in a relationship with a psychopath, say you marry one, what happens after a while is they start noticing that they're losing weight with no energy. They're not able to think clearly anymore because the psychopath is playing mind games on them constantly. They're after a while they're telling them they're useless and stupid. And they actually change as people. I've seen people who've married psychopaths go from vi- vibrant, alive people with a spark in their spark in their eye into a very short time into slouching, you know, robots who are just sort of like, you know, lost the spark of life in them. 
and a psychopath had, would have taken that out through the months and months of gaslighting, projection, uh, crazy making and mind control and just destroying their, their psychological sovereignty. And that's what's been done to us as a species. We've actually been helped. We've been damaged or we're still being damaged. We're being attacked. We have to remember that we're being attacked by these people. You know, they're, they, they don't see us. This is why they don't see us like them. They see us as different. They see us as being very different. You have people like Bertrand Russell, you know, talking about this, how eventually there'll be two different species on Earth. There'll be them and there'll be us. And that's what they, that's what they believe. Now, what, no, he wasn't talking about psychopaths back then, back then, but that's, well, that's what he was, that's what he was really talking about. So you're talking about like the psychopaths with the next day of the stage in Darwinian evolution, which is absolute rubbish. It's just something if you talk to psychopaths, they try to tell you themselves that this is what they believe in, that they're the next, the next stage of evolution. But if, if, if evolution was to make psychopaths the next stage, it would destroy humanity because no, psychopaths cannot work together. They're, and they also can't, they're also not autonomous. They're, they're totally a parasite. They're totally dependent upon the enablers. So if, if it was just the psychopaths, if the psychopaths were the next stage in human development, they'd all turn on each other until one psychopath was gone, standing on his own, and then he'd die of starvation. So, I mean, be, based on that uh, scenario then, can we say that the psychopathic tendency and the sort of collective tendency has no end game? It maybe thinks that it does, which is survival of its own kind, the dominance of its own kind, but ultimately, if seen from the outside... There isn't really a, a, an end game. A play, you know, the only end game is, is, is destruction of everything. Yeah, but that the end game really is to wake the light of fire on their our backsides. Uh, I, I believe also that you that nature doesn't make mistakes in this regard. That it will, if there's a, a problem with a species, it will create a mutation within the species to maybe shake things up to try and get the species changing. I really do believe that because ultimately like, I do believe that the, that the universe is unfolding like a flower. It's more like a seed. It's not, it has an actual destiny. It's moving towards something. And that to me is overwhelmingly uh, visible when you look at the cosmos and everything and even how nature functions. Well, this is one of the, sorry, sorry. I was just going to say it's one of the most interesting points in um, Defeated Demons was your idea that, uh, psychopaths are here for a purpose and again the apologies do please pick up the point you were making before i interrupted sure yeah but that's it that's what they're here for uh, there's a, i spoke in the first book puzzling people about how in ireland there was literally there was very poor uh, social laws protecting women and children and uh, it wasn't until all these catholic priests all start having pedophilic attacks on children and then the abuses of women in the Magdalene laundries and so on like that, that Irish society evolved to give better protection to women and children. And this is because the psychopaths in the Catholic Church inspired this by their behavior. And I think that's the ultimate purpose of psychopaths. But, you know, this is not a negative thing. We're actually, being, we're actually being involved here. And what's happening is the psychopath mutation has been spawned off to kind of attack us in order for us to get our act together and start looking after each other. Ultimately, the end game of all psychopathic attacks is a personal rejuvenation of the individual, the community, or the uh, the system that they have actually demolished. And what happens then is the people, the system, the community comes back stronger than ever. So it's uh, it's it's probably in an evolutionary sense to prevent complacency within humanity, because we have become very complacent in a lot of ways. The kind of sheep mindset and the sheep mentality. And I believe that nature does things like this. It's, it's, it, it does have an underlying purpose. There is a purpose to it. And the psychopath has no end game for itself. It's just a, a spasm, a, an evolutionary spasm, a mutation. It's come here to serve a purpose for a while. And the eventual, pur eventual outcome will be a better society, a more evolved, compassionate, empathic human society. And the psychopath will simply have no place anymore and vanish. So they're just, they're a trigger. That's the way I'd put them. They're a trigger for evolutionary changes. Yeah, it reminds me of a, I don't know, if a film called uh, Serenity. It was based on the uh, TV series Firefly, which was sadly cancelled after one run. But anyway, there's a character in that film. I can't remember the character's name or indeed the actor, but his whole role in it, I mean, he's a nasty piece of work. And at one point when he's been confronted about, why, why are you doing what you're doing you know what, what sort of future do you have do you want and he said i'm a monster 
there's no place in the future world for people like me, you know, and it, oh. it reminds me of that, actually. But he's, Very he's, there, cool. I like that. he's there to perform a function. He knows what he's doing. And then he knows that when he dies, everything that he was dies with him. And, and it's a good thing. But he's able to be a complete uh, remorseless, uh, you know, senseless, emotionless uh, monster in order to fulfill his role. He's like a robot, I suppose. Well, that ties very much in with the whole Jungian idea of uh, the the actual truth they're told is told the actual truth of the world, of the conscious world is being tr told through the allegory of consciousness of motif and mythology and so on. So there, you know, I'm glad you told me that because that's very much what I believe, and that's the there it is coming from the creative world. Mm -hmm. they, they, they're revealing the subconscious nature, the con subconscious dynamics of the inner world of, of the human experience, the collective unconscious, through these reveals. So that's that's spot on. Yeah, I'm just a monster here for a while, to serve a purpose, and there's no future for me. Mm. It's interesting also what you say, uh, comments earlier about uh, almost like, you know, the psychopath being, uh, you know, an, an aberration, almost like a different species, but, you know, a sort of different subspecies, I think is the phrase you used, because I've often thought, uh, before, w even from when I was quite young, when I'd see people on TV and some people were clearly different from others, there was a certain type of person I would see on the television and lo and behold, they were generally politicians or business people. And I've always been able to see through people, if you know what I mean, to, oh, yeah. to see, you know, to see that with their humanity or lack of it. And for me, it was manifested in the eyes. I, I would say to people, you know, people like Tony Blair, I say, there's just something not there. There's something not right there. And it's in the eyes. It's in the fixed grin. And in the their eyes are dead like sharks. And even, you know, someone like Blair, I use him, his example, uh, gladly, because I detest what the guy has done, what he stands for, what he continues to do. Um, and he can breeze onto the television looking as, you know, well-groomed and smiley and oh, aren't his teeth white and he can... All the sweet words flow forth, all the reassuring nonsense. But in there, there is a sort of cold, dead core, <laughs> you know, like a dead planet. And they, that's something he has in common with a lot of other people, manipulators and controllers in positions of power, who when you get anywhere near them, you, you only have to see a picture of them, you say, that person is not human, not the way I am anyway. Yeah, and what you've done there is you're, you've actually brought up how we'll actually win this because you, your, your intuition was what was talking to you then and a lot of people who were in relationships with psychopaths will often tell you that, it, that their initial response to this person will stay away from them this, this is there's something not right here but because they were uh, manipulated and used and flattered or whatever mm. they uh, they 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 bypass their intuition it just goes to show you how powerful intuition is well yeah he's he's a classic example of that you mentioned the eyes i saw a photograph of that that CIA operative, Gloria Steinem, who founded Miss Magazine with a grant from the CIA back in the 60s. She was a fully paid up, she's the, the great feminist leader. And she's nothing, been nothing all her life other than a CIA stooge uh, pretending to be a women's rights leader. I saw a photograph of her recently. This woman is nearly in her 70s and she's, she has that classic psychopathic smile where it's just barely a grin. You know, it's almost like a teeth are gritten. And, uh, she has no, this woman is in near, I think she's, she's probably over 70 now, and she has no uh, crow's feet on either side of her eyes. That's because she's never made a sincere smile <laughs> in her entire life. Yes. Well, that's interesting you touch upon her and her work, because even though you spoke at the outset about the, the female psychopath and, uh, you know, the, the, the ratio and the numbers, and certainly we see that behavior manifesting in, in women, uh, but part of the the psychopathic agenda and certainly part of what we've seen in certainly the second half of the 20, 20th century and it's ongoing is the distortion and the destruction of the feminine and that's something and even the feminine tendency in men you know that side of them and that's something that when you go back to the indigenous societies you find it a more feminine world as it were you know with the, the matriarch and and the ideas of that, tying that in with nature and with, with balance and um yeah, so that's something you touch upon also uh, in, in Defeated Demons. Oh, yeah, well, the destruction of females has been key because, well, women are very intuitive. They're far more intuitive than men. They have to be because they got to take care of babies and things like that. 
you have to select the careful mate. And so they were just doing it in an indigenous way. And they've always known this, and they've been, they, you know, they invented feminism to destroy females. It had nothing to do with uh, empowering women. That's why you have things like slut walk and rock the slut, and all these uh, women calling themselves sluts as part of nowadays as a symbol of their, empower, their empowerment. It's quite horrific what's been done. They've also, they've, 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 t- they've made a situation where women who are maybe spiritually very complete or you know, have their act together, they're suddenly the women who can't get men. They're they're pushed out of society and push, they push the ones in the middle who are like uh, vapid and vacuous and stuff like that. And they're the ones that are being held up as the, the normal woman. And it's a, uh, oh, it's horrific what's been done. And that's, you know, the, 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 the first victims and the, the greatest victims of the psychopathic control grid is the females. In the same way, psychopathic serial killers go looking for women. You know, they rarely go looking for men. The psychopaths in control of the system, they're going looking for women and they destroy it. They try to destroy it through fashion, industry, oh, everything, you name it, cosmetics, plastic surgery, advertising. And the woman is the, is the target because the psychopath knows on this, an instinctual level that the, the women are the ones that can take them down because they have such powerful instincts. So they've gone after them first, and 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 the main the main target it was been two pronged attacked like with all psychopaths, and one they, the one side is the feminist saying you should not be a sex object for men, and the same the same system is feeding this thing where they say you have to get plastic boobs and blood bum implants so all the men will want you. Mm. Crazy well, making. I have to ask. I'm not. You've probably read uh, the book A Clockwork Orange or possibly and or seen the film of it and the idea in presented in there um, is basically the idea that a psychopath violent psychopath could be reformed through some sort of radical therapy now I don't believe from what we said so far that you would find this very encouraging idea but is there any evidence of not of a cure but is there any evidence of psychopaths reforming their behavior in a significant way? No, it's never happened because even when they were pretending to be reformed, they'd put their head under the CAT scan or the MRI and they would do the usual diagnostic testing and find that they were just as deficient, well not deficient, but like lacking in activity of their frontal cortexes and their limbic regions where processing of information take place. I've never read the book of Clockwork Orange, but I've certainly seen the film. And there's actually, they, they, they do have that scene at the end where through a, it's sort of like a behavioral therapy. Mm-hmm. They try to get the main character played by Malcolm McDowell to reform his psychopathic tendencies. But what's very interesting is while the behavioral therapy is going on, he appears, he appears to be actually being shocked by the horrors of the world, and he start, he's starting to get what empathy and remorse is. Mm-hmm. But as soon as they take the uh, the gear off him and he steps up, he says, I was cured all right, meaning I was cured during the behavioral therapy, but he's still a psychopath. Yeah. You know, he was cured in the moment. So the only thing that would work with them is a kind of Pavlovian conditioning that if they, uh, you know, if one comes in here and tries to take my wallet, and I, I punch him in. And the team knock a few his teeth out. He knows not to do it again. So he won't. He won't steal my wallet. Not because he has learned remorse. He's, he won't steal my wallet again because he, he wants to hold on to the remainder of his teeth. That's not the same thing as a human being who would understand empathy and remorse. That the money in my wallet would be needed to pay my electric bill and, and feed my family. He would not see it that way. It's just mm-hmm. business. So that's the only way around them. No, there's there, there's there, there's there's no way of curing them. There was some quacks in America. Uh, who pumped a couple of them full of drugs in a prison. But that's not, that's not curing, and that's just a chemical lobotomy. And there's, there's this other, there was this other in the idiot, uh, another educated idiot with a PhD, claiming he, we got them as, as children, we could cure them, and yet he offered no, no scientific uh, proof of what he, what he claimed he could do. Uh, there was nothing peer-reviewed, and it was just, the statement he'd made to get himself in the paper. It was basically what he was proposing was that if you if you love psychopaths more and show them more kindness, they'll get better. And, th- and that to me, I was laughing my head off when I was, because that's like throwing gasoline on a fire, mm. you know? And also the idea of getting them as children and, and teaching them to be kind, 
that's like getting a polar bear and feeding them their uh, broccoli and then and then hoping that they don't eat seals when they grow up. Mm. So, so sort of round up then, begin to, to to round up for today. We're facing a situation globally where the unholy trinity of governments and corporations and religious institutions, and to that we could probably add uh, the education system, health system, the systems basically that that, that control and orientate our lives are displaying, have been long displaying psychopathic, anti-human, from our perspective, illogical, destructive tendencies. But you ultimately believe that we're being challenged here to evolve in consciousness, you know, which is probably the, the as you say, that the root of evolution in the first place. And ultimately, we can transcend this psychopathic control grid, is, is your phrase, which I think sums it up very well and move towards a post-psychopathic society. Oh yeah, it's happening, it will happen. The, the psychopathic control grid is in absolute chaos. It's falling apart economically, environmentally, socially, politically. On every level, it's collapsing. And the only thing that keeps it going is that the, the delusion is kept one more year of delusion is kept going to make us believe in this system, but people aren't voting anymore. The mainstream media has completely lost all its numbers. You know, CNN in the whole United States now gets something like 200,000 daily viewers out of 300 million people. That's mm. how much the mainstream media is dead now. And the alternative media is now really the mainstream media because the people who listen to that, even if they're small numbers, are the ones who are paying attention and acting on it. My attitude is, look, it's all falling apart, and you don't have to. You don't sit there and you wait. You don't wait for it to fall apart. You get knowledge. Of the, you get knowledge of the system. You get knowledge. You read about it. You feed, discover, and you learn about psychopaths. You also find people like you in small groups, and there's never ever going to be a global awakening. This, you're not going to have the Occupy movement. is not going to change the world. That's all those old mass movements and things have all failed in the past because they can be co-opted, even if the people inside them have the, most, the best intentions, they can be co-opted and infiltrated. And they always are and always will be. The best way to do it is for people as individuals, like you said, to get a sovereign consciousness, then get small groups of people and start opting out of the system as much as you can in your own life. Become as independent as possible, become less... Uh, as less said, uh, you know, subject to to needing commercial stuff as possible. Get, get, learn all about all kinds of alternative things, alternative health, alternative therapies, alternative energy, cutting your own firewood, anything. Learn new skills, very very important. And then ju that also helps you develop your self confidence as well. So when this this thing ticks over, it'll be a smooth transition for you, rather than somebody who may have a complete their fate in the psychopathic control grid and then wakes up one morning and find out it's gone. So it's, yeah, no, it's, it's going to be a positive future. I have absolutely no doubt about that. Uh, I just, when I wrote this book, Puzzling People, uh, back in 2010, March 1st, I think it was, I, I just thought like, I'd sell a few copies and that would be the end of it. And the thing has absolutely exploded into like this, it's taken on a life of its own and everyone is fascinated by this stuff and everyone is, is suddenly they want to know about psychopaths and they, they're, they're starting to see that this does make a lot of sense but what's great about this is they don't, they don't have a state of fear it's not like when a lot of people wake up and they're suddenly fearful because my books provide people with a toolkit when you read them it's almost like a survival manual for the the, the shift that's going on right now because it will get nasty at times but I don't believe it's going to get as nasty as some people would like us to believe it, does. it will but it's going to be it's not going to be fun. But we'll come through the other side, a vastly improved species with a higher level of consciousness and uh, a more secure and happier world. And that's because the psychopath's time is over. I'm convinced of that now. They can't hide anymore. There's too many people talking about it now. It's a very very hot topic in the alternative media, and it's it's very and it's also covered quite well in the mainstream now which is surprising, but that just shows you that you, you can't stop something that's, you know, that's meant to be found out. So uh, I would ask people to just get knowledge of the system, get understand how psychopaths work, get them out of your own life, and uh, it'll, it'll be okay. Don't, don't, do not live in fear and terror, and just learn how to be independent. I think the phrase is um, an idea whose time has come, and yeah. there's a lot of people currently, I see it, you know, I see the, the uncertainty, 
uh, in people's faces, the, the you know the fear in some cases, and uh, they're looking at these systems that are crumbling, as you describe, and they're very fearful for the future because they think these are our systems. We built this. These are the things that keep us alive. But a, a point can come when you realize these are not our systems, not you and me, the, the non-psychopaths. We didn't build these systems. We didn't design them. We don't operate them. They're not for our benefit. We might wonder what's going to replace them. We don't even need to know right now. But if they're going away, which they are, it's not something to be afraid of. Well, yeah. And, you know, like when you said about the idea of a time that, you know, an idea whose time has come, I know people who are laughing and and, and making fun of people, you know, someone like a, say a, a true to type person a few years ago who was stockpiling food, uh, maybe buying silver, hoarding money into the mattress, whatever. They were being laughed at three years ago. I got news for you now. The one, lots of the ones who are laughing at them are now doing that themselves. Yeah, I mean, too, uh, in the sort of uh, movement, if you can loosely call it that, that you describe, two prominent figures. Uh, very different approaches to things. Say, for example, David Icke, a name a lot of people will know on one hand. On the other hand, the American talk show host, Alex Jones. These two people coming at their version of the truth from very different directions, but both of them being figures of absolute ridicule and hate and vitriol uh, at one point with no audience. Both now have got huge audiences. Whatever you think of their information, people are listening to them. Uh, the, a lot of them, the people who laughed at them, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Well, the tour that you that you saw me on in Manchester, it was unfortunate Manchester didn't get the big numbers, but London and Dublin were packed. Mm. And and I, what's the shot shocked me most about London and Dublin, especially D London, was the audience was filled with professionals. Yes. And they weren't your mainstream truthers. They were there too, but I had people coming up to me afterwards who were scientists, clinical psychologists, psychiatrists even, telling me, Thank God someone is talking about this stuff at last. Because I was talking to one psychiatrist in London who told me that with, with one signature, you could have anyone in that room sectioned for six months. He has more power than a, than a Supreme Court judge in terms of locking someone up. And he told me that because the whole, medic, the whole psychiatric profession is run by a bunch of psychopaths. Now, that would have never happened a few years ago. And these are the kind of people I was when I when I got on that stage in London and looked across that crowd. What I was seeing was like was was England, you know, was was Britain. All aspects of like the truthers were there, the the anti chemtrail people were there, all those the, all those other people. All scattered amongst them was large numbers of people who were who lost money and property, had seen their pensions vanish, and they were. And this was to me, I I, I remember thinking that was an amazing experience. That I witnessed on that financial terrorism tour the absolute shift. Yeah, I mean, people know the, the majority of people that have you know maybe for a long time didn't pay attention to any what they would have seen as extraneous, extreme, fringe information. It, they can no longer ignore the fact that things are breaking, things are broken, and they're beginning now in, in increasing numbers to say, "Okay, I'm ready for this now. Tell me, you know, show me the matrix." Exactly. That's a very good way of putting it, Greg. And another aspect to it as well is that they're not walking down the street handing out flyers or shouting through megaphones. But that doesn't mean they don't know this stuff. Mm. They're at home talking about it with their wives, their husbands, their mates. It's very quietly spoken about. Spoken about. It's all. It's all. It's all. It's a whispering campaign that's happening at home against the, the psychopathic control grid. And uh, the fact that I've gotten so little flack for, for my own work, almost nothing, shows you that there's a, the thing has changed now. That people are like, yeah, that makes sense. It should make sense. And that's what's happening. So, you know, it's a positive message. It's like you, uh, you, we should finish this show on a positive thing, and, and we should be positive. Just because they're not marching in the streets carrying placards and banners doesn't mean the revolution isn't taking place. It most certainly is. And the fact that the mainstream media is dying is one of the biggest ones of all. Yeah, well, that's, that's a great point on which to end, actually. So uh, in conclusion, though, uh, I should sort of remind people about your books, tell them about your website and any perhaps forthcoming events. I know I spotted that you're going to be just down the road from here in the not too distant future in Hebden Bridge. But uh, yeah, just to tell everyone whatever information you want to share. I'm a... Uh... I'm going to be in England in a, on the 19th of July, which is a Thursday night in Hebden Bridge, 
showing see a lot other side of my work my work is is developing human consciousness by ex- bringing the, the right brain up the key with the left brain and the best way I found of doing that is using the tarot to actually develop a sort of psychoanalytical system where people can actually help themselves deal with problems I call the system a uh, tarot psyche and I'm going to be debuting that that in a, the first workshop in Hebden Bridge uh, on the Thursday, the 19th of July. Two days later, I'm going to be doing a talk on psychopaths with the English uh, side of the sovereign independent movement uh, newspaper guys. And that's going to be in Dunstable, which is uh, near Luton Airport, I believe. Mm-hmm. And that's and then in, in September 8, I'm back in Manchester for a big pres- a big talk, a big event on a. Uh, it's going to be a, 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 a basically a, on esoteric issues and stuff like that. And I'll be there talking along with Neil Haig and some other people about what I'm going to. I'm going to actually be coming out of the closet in terms of my actual belief regarding things like uh, demonic possession and the supernatural. And mm-hmm. how it relates to psychopaths. I had to get very straight there in the first when I first broke it onto the scene. I couldn't be too spooky about this stuff. But I have people, I people who've been extremely damaged by psychopaths have seen everything from poltergeist activity to what they would call demonic attacks to say women who didn't even never read a book on UFOs in their lives while their husband was destroying them psychologically, would go for a walk one day and see UFOs. Uh, these were talking about atheists, people who never had a, a religious exp- or a spiritual experience in their lives, mm-hmm. seeing things. So I want to actually present this for the first time in public because I feel it's very, very important and it ties very deeply into the whole idea of Carl Jung and the documents that he wrote on what si- flying saucers actually were back in the 1940s. And I think... Uh, this is so. This is another subject that's come of its time. It's time to start looking at the paranormal as well and what it really means in terms of human consciousness. So that's kind of where I'm going from this point on. Mm. Well, that really does sound fascinating. Actually, I look forward to uh, uh, hearing you speak about that, and hopefully, we'll get something written about that um, sooner rather than later. Um, is Thomas Sheridan Arts? Uh, is that that's your main website? Is it? Am I correct? Yeah, ThomasSheridanArts.com. Mm-hmm. And certainly we'll have a link to that posted up and also links to uh, your two books. So, um, well, just in conclusion, then, thank you very much, Thomas Sheridan, uh, for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. Well, thank you, Greg. It's been a pleasure. Well, that's it for another time. Once again, thank you so much for listening. Just a reminder that Thomas' website is thomassheridanarts.com. I'd urge you to check that out. There you will find all the information regarding his books and of course all his other work. Until next time, I'm Greg Moffat, and you've been listening to LegalizeFreedom.com.